Dzień dobry Państwu. Witam Państwa bardzo serdecznie. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, at the opening session of the World in Focus International Gatherings. Uh, I'm Piotr Buras and I'm the director of the uh, Warsaw uh, Office of the uh, ISOFAR uh, organization, which uh, together with the Heinrich Böhl Foundation, represented by Małgorzata Kopka standing next to me, has the pleasure to co-organize this event. Uh, so I'm very happy that you accepted this invitation and that uh, you are present in this uh, beautiful albeit slightly too big, too spacious room, um, and this afternoon to embark on a two-day long gathering dedicated to a number of uh, international problems and international issues. Uh, the whole concept behind the world in focus was such that um, we concluded when we were talking to each other that uh, the future of uh, Poland in Europe, the future of Europe in general, these are the issues uh, which are recurrent uh, matters uh, in uh, diplomatic circles at universities, but also they tend to be quite commonly discussed topics in private conversations in our homes. And this happens by no, this is no accident. This uh, is actually uh, quite logical because uh, throughout those two decades uh, we have got used to the idea that the world outside is this inspiration to us, something that we tend to discuss gradually through traveling, through uh, reading various books, uh, through following particular political events. But this world outside um, was some kind of a source of fascination to us. It was mesmerizing. And uh, it is still like that. But uh, at the same time, we are taken aback by, this, by the pace of changes uh, that uh, happen in this world outside. So we represent here these two institutions that are focused on international matters and we deal with these issues on an everyday basis in a number of uh, dimensions. Um, we wanted to uh, extend this discussion, to, to deepen this discussion on these international issues in Poland, to make it uh, a bit more appealing, a bit more interesting to the general public, hence the concept of the world in focus that uh, we have the pleasure to open today. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome all of on behalf of Heinrich Bühl Foundation. As Piotr mentioned, uh, who my organization, Piotr's organization, are uh, focused on an everyday basis on those international matters. Um, very often uh, we discuss these issues in those uh, closed uh, um, experts teams, but uh, we wanted to uh, make this uh, knowledge uh, more uh, public to share our discussion. Um, thanks to the cooperation with partnerships uh, that we have, uh, 11 partnerships um, uh, in question, and uh, we would like to thank them for uh, preparation of this debate, uh, for uh, um, preparation of a number of uh, uh, attractive events and, uh, and entertainment uh, that we will discuss in a moment. So uh, thanks to this uh, joint effort, uh, we succeeded in uh, organizing a two-day-long gathering. We feel that we have no monopoly for the knowledge on these issues, and uh, we think that it is uh, always worth discussing such matters. We are happy to uh, organize our event under the auspices of 12 media um, and other types of um, institutions, uh, also under the auspices of the President of Warsaw and uh, the uh, Office of uh, the uh, Ombudsman of Citizens' Rights, and uh, uh, we will have uh, yet another opportunity to dwell upon the value of uh, citizens' rights in this uh, group of experts and attendees. So we have a number of those uh, bigger and, and, and smaller organizations that we partner up with. Uh, we get to know each other gradually, and uh, I hope that they will uh, stay by us and uh, we can uh, get some more contributors um, that can uh, close ranks with us on um, in organizing these eff efforts in the future. Uh, we will start uh, the discussion in a moment, uh, and 
and uh, the, I feel that uh, the topic of this uh, debate will be probably most fundamental in terms of the issues that we need to deal with nowadays, especially from the point of Europe, because we will discuss the future of the Western world. I'm not able at the moment to enumerate all the topics that we will be touching upon, but I would like to focus on a couple of the most important uh, bullets on our agenda. Tomorrow morning we'll have this extremely interesting conversation about the future of Europe with the participation of Ivan Krastev, Sylvie Kaufman and Jan Zielonka. We will also have the opportunity to discuss yet another interesting matter straight after this panel, uh, the matter which uh, relates to the conflicts of the future. In other words, how uh, uh, we weaponize uh, trade and migration flows. And in a parallel session that will take place simultaneously, we will have the opportunity to discuss uh, the position of Russia in today's political landscape, how they uh, use uh, the media in a hybrid warfare. Tomorrow, we will also have the possibility to have a debate on uh, Islamic radicalization. We do not shun this topic. And uh, we have the opportunity to discuss a wide array of other problems. You have the agenda for today and tomorrow on this uh, a piece of paper and these, these uh, leaflets that we distributed among you. We would like also to uh, include in our debate uh, various forms of, of uh, conveying a message. Uh, apart from a debate, from a discussion, we have the Exilium exhibition that is just outside this room by Marta Bogdańska, and she uh, pictures in, on this, in this exhibition and the uh, fate of Syrian refugees um, and Lebanese refugees. And I would like you to uh, find some time for the screening of one of our movies. Um, this one is about uh, the hardships of uh, young refugees, how hard it is to find your own home here in this uh, world. And also we'll have uh, a presentation related to the education system from the point of view of people people who run schools and academic centers um, or who experience this firsthand. And also, we will have the opportunity to have a stroll around Muranov Boro, Muranov uh, district of Warsaw, a guided stroll. Um, Mrs. Bata will uh, uh, run this guided walk uh, in Muranov Boro. And tomorrow, we will have a belated uh, celebration of uh, um, Child's Day. Um, so we would like to encourage parents to take part in the discussion that will take place here, while kids will have uh, the opportunity to play around uh, here outside of uh, uh, this room and find some interesting things, interesting information about multicultural society. Um, and our foyer, the lobby, will be full of uh, the stalls of our partnership uh, organizations that partner up with us. Uh, you will have the opportunity to see what their activity focuses on, and uh, also you will have the opportunity to consult an international educator um, on such issues as how to deal with uh, uh, multiculturalism uh, at school, how to embrace the smelting pots also in the school environment. Thank you. Uh, that was the introduction to our debate, and now I'd like to proceed to the first session, which is dedicated to the future of uh, the West. I would like now to introduce our uh, renowned guests. We'll start from Judy Dempsey, which sits in the middle, a renowned expert on European affairs, a former correspondent of uh, Herald Tribune in New York Times, and currently she's an expert of a prestigious uh, uh, Carnegie Institute uh, located in Brussels, but she lives in Berlin. And on your left ha hand, your left hand, we have Ralf Fuchs, a director of uh, Heinrich Bühl Foundation, our partner, ISFR partner, uh, from Berlin. Uh, he's a well-known German intellectual, uh, an expert on European matters. And uh, on your right hand, you have Mark Leonard, um, a director of uh, ICFR, uh, my boss, in other words. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to uh, now uh, take part in the discussion that is just about to start.
Okay, so uh, from this seat here, the seat of a facilitator of this session, I will uh, um, allow myself to, to, to start this, to open this discussion, and we'll start from this uh, um, paper by a historian Winkler, a renowned historian Winkler, who wrote this uh, four volumes on history of the West. And um, at the end of this work, uh, there is this remark, 2014 will become part of uh, history as a breakthrough year, as a turning point when Western democracies had to bid farewell to their normative project, to abandon the normative project, to abandon the hope that this project uh, will um, become uh, embraced by other uh, regions, the rest of the world. Of course, we can uh, discuss whether um, 2014 is this uh, coda, this, this turning point. Uh, it is debatable. Winkler meant uh, the European-Russian aggression and uh, also the developments uh, in the Middle East. But I think that the analysis of Winkler is uh, very apt in that sense that after uh, 1989, we were convinced that the victory of the West in this ideological battle makes it uh, the only real weight, the only real power um, on this battlefield. And I think that uh, thanks to the uh, uh, dominance of the United States in this uh, monopolar world, uh, we actually could believe that. So we could believe that this is the reality. I wouldn't like to uh, bring up this uh, very often, this hackneyed uh, um, thesis of the end of history by Fukuyama, but I think that uh, this is quite a strong trend. I believe that uh, the West was associated in our mind with three things, uh, morally, uh, ideologically, but, uh, with what Winkler calls normative projects, in other words, uh, human values, liberal democracy, the rule of law, um, the division of, uh, of power. Secondly, a strong relationship uh, between Europe and the United States, so the common values and uh, common common sense of security, and the third issue, the third belief, that the West, in fact, shaped the world that uh, we live in at the moment. So the institutions that govern the world nowadays, the rules that we believe in, these are Western rules of the Western civilization. When we ask ourselves this question, does the West have the future ahead of it, we need to go back to these three points to these, to these three issues, because uh, there is lots of doubts around them. Of course, these values that we talked about uh, may not be unquestionable anymore uh, when it comes to the links, the relationship between uh, uh, the Europe and the states. Uh, is it so strong as it should be? It's debatable. Can the Western world still continue to lead the rest? of the planet, again, it's debatable. So um, I think that it is different in terms of our mentality uh, than it was uh, 20, 25 years ago. We have a different outlook on these things. So we have a number of dilemmas that we need to deal with. And I think that it would be worthwhile to discuss them with our guests. And it will be truly inspiring for us in the light of our future debates. I would like to start with uh, Ralph Fuchs. Um, what is the status quo, quo of uh, this normal normative project? What is the situation of the normative project understood as the set of uh, Europe European values, which uh, reached its, its turning point? Anne Applebaum wrote recently that uh, we are just a couple of uh, choices uh, away from uh, the end of the, the world that we know. If Brexit happens, if it takes place, if uh, Hofer wins the elections in, in, in uh, Austria, um, then it may actually be the case. This, this prophecy may actually turn true. Also in the States, Donald Trump, uh, a threat to, to uh, democracy. So this is my question to uh, Ralph Fuchs. Do we really deal nowadays, are we the witnesses of uh, um, far-reaching crisis of European values, or is it something temporary? First of all, Piotr, I would like to broaden the term a little bit. Uh, if we are talking about the West, it's not just about European values. Um, 
And it's even more than this kind of transatlantic normative project which started with the American Revolution of Independence and the French Revolution. So the idea of human rights, of self-governing of the people, of the rule of law, and the respect of the individual, the individual, the dignity of the individual. Um, for me, this is not a geographical project. It is an, a normative, as you quoted um, Mr. Winkler. So it is uh, not a closed shop. It is open, open for all nations, political nations, all societies who want to share this project. But it's true that this, um, I'd say, more uh, missionary view, the expansion of the idea of the West, the project of the West on a, on a global scale in the moment, seems a little bit um, way too optimistic. And I would agree that the West, in that meaning, and I use it as a kind of quid pro quo for the liberal democracy. The liberal democracy is in a deep crisis, and there are at least two fundamental challenges we are confronted with. The first one comes from within, domestically. The rise of authoritarian, xenoph xenophobic, nationalist, culturally conservative movements and parties all over the place. I would not yet use the term new fascism like uh, Robert Kagan did it when he labeled Donald Trump that way. And I'm still quite confident and optimistic that our democracies today are much more better equipped to deal with this authoritarian challenge than it was the case in the 20s and 30s of the last century. But I also would say there is a somewhat involving in Europe and in the United States and in other places you could coin as a kind of pre-fascist atmosphere, at least in parts of our societies. Of course, the situation is different from country to country, but there is a general trend I would describe as a widespread rollback or even a rebellion against the hegemony of the cosmopolitan, liberal, postmodern academic middle classes. In the US, it's the rebellion against the East and West Coast bubble. In Europe, it's against the liberal, green-minded urban elites. And I think we are indeed facing a clash of cultures today, but in a quite different sense than Huntington predicted it. It's a clash of cultures within the West. Multiculturalism versus ethnic and cultural homogeneity, more or less open borders versus closing borders and strengthening, re-erecting borders again to shield us against the turmoil of uh, the, our global environment. A positive approach to economic and political and cultural globalization versus um, economic protectionism and striving for cultural uh, homogeneity, liberalization of labor markets versus restoring st the, the strong protective state, 
gender equality and LGBTI rights versus conservative family values, ongoing process of European integration, so the post-nationalist approach versus restoring national sovereignty and the idea of a sovereign democracy. And finally, transatlantic integration versus alliances with Russia. This is part of that political and cultural conflict we are facing in our own hemisphere. And Putin Russia indeed, and this is the second part of the challenge, the external challenge. Putin Russia indeed has become the new Rome of these anti-liberal forces, the center of an all European populist network. So the second part of the challenge is an authoritarian role back in the European neighborhood. We are far away from the idea in the early 90s that not only the whole of Europe, but the whole world would gradually um, evolve in the direction of liberal democracy, the specific combination of market economy and, and democratic institutions. Russia and her allies in, in, in the East. This is a kind of new authoritarian model governed by former KGB agents. Turkey, very unfortunate um, rollback from democratic reform and European integration into also a new kind of neo-imperial authoritarianism. Egypt, the failure of the Arab Spring and um, the rollback of dictatorships in the Middle East, the rise of a new kind of militant Islamic fundamentalism, which also could be interpreted as a a counter movement against this kind of liberal modernity. And on the global level, of course, China will come back to that later. And what is specific with all these different kind of authoritarianisms we are confronted with in our nearer and wider neighborhood is that these regimes are extremely self-assertive. You know, there's not, not at all a kind of uh, bad conscience or so. Yeah, you know, they, 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 they don't um, um, feel the need to, to um, um, defend themselves. No, it's the other way around. Um, so I think this kind of double challenge, uh, this is really a new quality. And if we finally ask why, I think we have to um, throw a, criti a critical look to ourselves. The West didn't do well in the last 20 years beginning with the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, caused by the Western economies, the European Union in a very bad shape, growing social discrepancies in our societies, a growing mood of fear from the future and mistrust in political elites, rejection of globalization becoming the, the dominant uh, public mood in, in, in Europe and the United States, economic stagnation, huge youth unemployment in, 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 in a lot of young states. So I would say, yes, this is not a failure of liberal democracy, but to a certain extent it's a failure 
of our political and economic elites. And if we don't get our acts together and clean up the mess at home, we will not restore this kind of global outreach and, and their credibility. Yeah, thank you very much, Ralph. I was going to switch into English to, to make our conversation flow more smoothly. <laughs> uh, so, you, you outlined very well this, the double challenge of the, uh, of the West, and I would like to pick up on one of the points you mentioned in the first, um, in the first part. Um, you talked about the, this rebellion against um, the values of cosmopolitanism, openness, uh, um, globalism whatsoever. And I think the, the whole politics of the West was traditionally shaped by the division into left and right. That was the, the traditional uh, cleavage in the Western societies uh, formed around the issues of economic and social policies. Do you think, Judy, that we have to do today with a different, with an emergence of a different cleavage between, as one of our colleagues once noted, would run between a, you know, globalism and territorialism, that there is a, that the, the attitude to globalization, openness, is the new emerging uh, feature which makes difference uh, between these two camps competing in the European or Western politics. Thanks, Piotr. And um, thank you for inviting me. And it's great to see so many young faces here. Um, you got me with the surprise question because the one country that isn't rejecting globalization and isn't retreating into territorialism is China. So that's the first thing. We will go back to Russia at a later stage. Um, I, can I, I would like to answer yeah. this question in a very different way. My original um, um, brief was to look at the transatlantic relationship of transatlanticism. You, you would do that. Yes. I will do this. But um, I want to open up this discussion in a different way. It's, I've been in Warsaw many, many times, but I'm ashamed to say that this is the first time I've been here in the square. And here was the ghetto. And here is the embodiment of suffering on the one hand, and one hopes the immortality of memory. And what I see taking place now in Europe and in the transatlantic relationship is the forgetting of memory. It was the Second World War that really brought the United States and Europe together. And it was the aftermath of the Second World War in which the Americans, led by the Secretary of State at the time, Dean Ashison, that actually pushed France and Germany into reconcilia reconciliation through the creation of the European Coal and Steel Community, the precursor of today's European Union. And this extraordinary emotional, historical, practical um, building, it was, it was a fantastic architecture of, of a special West that made Europe what it was and protected Europe against, um, against the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. The institutions of NATO and the EU were the embodiment of this special West. And in no, we, we just can't underestimate how important this transatlantic relationship was. And in the 1990s, something even better happened actually, it was the putting into practice a Europe whole and free. You're all sitting, you're all very, very young. Some of you may not have been born when uh, this was happening. The Americans and the Europeans, the Germans and the French. The French were made perhaps a little bit lukewarm sometimes about enlargement. But it was our new, it was, it was as if it was the second phase of this transatlantic relationship, make, completing the unification of Europe first through Germany, and secondly, bringing in Poland, bringing in the former communist countries. Of course, don't forget, um, we brought in Spain and Portugal, again, that was earlier on, and Greece, again, always, always, always hand in hand with the Americans. And this was what made the transatlantic relationship special. 
How have we got into this malaise? We've got into this malaise for several reasons. One is the decline of memory or the abuse of memory as some governments now in Europe exercise. Secondly, it's a change of generation. Even though uh, Donald Trump likes to um, deny that he has European background, and he really doesn't like Europe, you've got to be very careful if he wins. But there's a younger generation, the, 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 how would I say this? The European immigrants who went to the US, part of this generation is leaving the political elite structure and being replaced by a younger generation, a younger elite who don't have that connection with Europe. This matters. This changes the discourse. This changes the perception of, the, of America and Europe. And above all, and I'm sure many of you, or maybe some of you, have been to the United States, there's no discussion of Europe. It's far away. It doesn't figure in the newspapers. We are a curiosity. Um, difficult, lazy, we don't look after our security, burden sharing, defense. And the, the, the political discourse and the gap between the United States and Europe is extremely wide now. And this is very, very worrying. Um, the third thing is that this kind of um, distortion or loss of memory is affecting the political parties. The political parties that emerged in Europe in 1945 were generally, as, as Piotr mentioned, left and right. You knew where you stood with them. Two uh, bloc parties, of course, it was difficult here. It was completely different in, in, in um, former communist Eastern Europe. But these two traditional structures of power are now being eroded. And they're being eroded partly because, uh, mainly because of globalization, um, and they are being eroded because these political parties haven't responded to the rapidly changing social structures that are now taking place across Europe. Um, there's huge gaps now being filled by populist movements, by nationalists, by conservatives which don't identify with the old conservative parties. Because, um, as, as Piotr sort of mentioned, it's the territorialization of politics because it's the rejection of the globalization. We see this in pockets of Poland, especially in Eastern Hungary, which is very, very poor, and I can understand why they support Fidesz. You see this in pockets of my own country, Ireland. There's a, a, there are swathes of a population who feel threatened by globalization and who feel that they didn't, they haven't gained from it. It's intangible. It's, it's out there, and, it's, and if, you only, if you want to grasp it, you enter, you enter a a race, you have to be very, very fit. So this is a rejection of globalization, but to reject it and believe that you can cut yourself off and build borders, it's simply not possible. This kind of rejection weakens uh, transatlanticism. And on the other side of the Atlantic, we see what's happening with the discourse and the narrative of the US presidential campaign. Even the Americans themselves, the elites, are, are uh, 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 horrified by the level of discourse. But this is... Um, this is damaging for, uh, for, the, for the West in general, it's, and it's damaging for the perception by outsiders of the West for the simple reason that the West was always the attraction. One last point about this fading attraction of the West or the West's failure to make itself attractive. I, I, I want to touch not so much on, on Russia, which we, I'm sure we'll go back to later. I want to touch on what's happening in the Middle East. The discourse now in the EU institutions and indeed among the member states of the European Union is not helping civil society with human rights in the Middle East. It's actually promoting the S word, stabilization. And stabilization, if you talk to EU officials, this is, this is what these people want these people, by the way. This is what they want. Um, they, don't, they, they don't want the environment issues. They don't want human rights issues. They don't want freedom of the press issues. They want stabilization. Firstly, stabilization is becoming associated with security. Security is becoming associated with, with dealing with terrorism. These three issues, this part of this triangle, are actually pushing the whole human rights aspect to the periphery. And since human rights and values have been the bedrock of Europe and of the West, the liberal values, personally, I think civil societies, civil society movements, particularly in Egypt, will feel isolated and alone if the West pursues only stabilization without coupling it with human rights. This brings me back to the, the liberal agenda if we still have the courage to pursue it. 
we didn't have the courage to pursue it even during solidarity uh, in the 1980s. Solidarity was a threat to the Western order. Solidarity was a threat to the status quo. Um, I remember left-wing movements across Europe and the trade union movements wouldn't support solidarity because the Cold War was, a, was an acceptable status quo and solidarity brought in uncertainty, un unpredictable. Well, I'm sorry, civil society is unpredictable and freedom is unpredictable and building democracy is very uncertain. But as, as, a, as the West, as, as, the, as the, I suppose, the guardian of, of, liberal, of liberalism, to to retreat into territorialism and to outsource certain aspects of, of an issue such as democracy and replace it with stabilization or authoritarian regimes, which are accumulating more and more, is, will lead to the politics of self-fulfilling prophecy, the decline of liberalism and the decline of the West. And once that decline cannot be stopped, not only will we lose the attraction, the West actually will, will forego its authority and will, be and will be substituted by something far worse. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Judy. And uh, we will certainly get back to, the, to, the, to this question of uh, how the West is uh, seen from outside and how, what is the impact uh, of the West on the design of the world as we can expect. Um, but I would like to pick up for, um, on the, your remarks on, on the US and, and the transatlantic link, uh, asking uh, Mark about, um, about not, on, not just about Donald Trump, but uh, I think we, we mentioned that the rise of Donald Trump is a very remarkable development and that his success is today not only just a symbol of, of a political or social crisis in, in, in the US, but probably also a, harb a harbinger of a major uh, reorientation into transatlantic relations after the Second World War. And, uh, but even without Trump, I think uh, these relations would change its nature. So my question to Mark is, do we, do you think that we should get prepared for a post-American century or a post-American world? And what would it mean for Europe? Well, I think we, we've been living in a post-American world for the last few years anyway. I mean, if you look at every theater in the world, the political dynamics have, have changed fundamentally. You know, 10, 15 years ago, in the run-up to the Iraq war, all discussion about foreign policy was about how to deal with an American empire which was as powerful as any force since Rome and most discussions about global issues were about dealing with America's uh, overbearing presence in every single part of the world and America was the, the main source of order and disorder in most of the theatres in the world. Whereas now you just look at a map of the world and you can see the US withdrawing from Afghanistan while China talks to the Taliban and helps to create a new political settlement there. You can look at an Islamic state being carved out of Iraq and Syria right under America's nose. You can see, if you look at Africa, that the, the ugly Chinaman has now replaced the ugly American as the face of, of global capitalism. If you look at the situation in, in Ukraine with Russia, it's uh, Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande who are negotiating with, with Vladimir Putin. It's not uh, President Obama. And even if you go further out to the, the Pacific Ocean, which is the bit of the world where the US is meant to be pivoting to, the balance of power is changing year by year away from America towards China. And American allies are becoming more and more nervous about America's staying power the strength of its commitments, they're developing their own relationships between themselves and the whole hub and spokes relationship which linked every single country to Washington is now uh, being supplemented by much stronger links between the spokes um, because they realize that America's not enough to, to defend them on their own. They need to defend themselves. They need to rethink their own relationships with each other. And they're weighing the, the tensions between 
being loyal Western countries and standing up for your own kind of interests. So, for example, after the, the Russian annexation of Crimea, uh, a lot of Japanese people were deeply unhappy about being encouraged to, to take sanctions against uh, Russia because for them, Russia is uh, part of their hedge against Chinese hegemony in the region. Having a good relationship with Russia is m probably more important than them than who controls Crimea. So um, I think we're seeing a world emerging with a multitude of powers competing with each other in different ways, through hybrid wars, through economic sanctions, through naval maneuverings, where economic globalization is powered as much by Chinese as by Western capital. And the US is still an important feature of every single part of the world, but it's no longer the main provider of order. It's more a resource which people are trying to manipulate. So if you look at each of these different regions, it's the local powers that are determining what's going on. In the Middle East, it's Saudi Arabia and Iran. In our part of the world, it's more the EU and Russia that are the, the kind of key actors when it comes to Ukraine. If you look at, um, uh, at Asia, I think Japan and India are probably more important to the future of Asia than the, the United States is if we look for the next few decades. And that is a, a fundamentally different kind of world that, 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 that we're talking about. And it does mean that, um, that uh, people are therefore in each part of the world trying to kind of reorientate their policies because the, the, the link between the sort of values of the West that we were talking about and the hard power of the West is a complicated one. It's not entirely, you know, the history is written by, by the victors. So we like to think that the reason that every part of the world has embraced Western values, liberal democracy, et cetera, et cetera, is because they're the greatest values, it's the ultimate end point of human civilizational advance in a kind of Hegelian sense. Um, but some other people might argue that the reason why the rest of the world has, has embraced these values is because all but 14 countries in the world have at some stage been uh, controlled by my country. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and after that, the US was very pre prevalent in different parts of the world. And you know, the imperial powers set up schools, institutions. Um, they impose their, their ideas in a way that's not always very soft. And, um, you know, that does have a kind of certain impact on the way that people look at the world. And that's one of the things which is sort of, I think, been happening in recent times as well. As hard power has become more widespread, uh, so have the, the values which are at play in different parts of the world. And what was very interesting about the Arab uprisings was that I think people did embrace the idea that they could control their, their, their own future, the idea of dignity was absolutely central to all of the uprisings everywhere. But their idea of dignity was about emancipating themselves from the ideas of the West rather than embracing the ideas of the West. What happened in Egypt was the opposite of 1989 uh, over here rather than uh, a direct parallel of it. And actually, in, in many of these places, there is a, a, quite a big tension between democracy and, and self-emancipation and liberalism. Um, and in fact, it's a tension which we're increasingly feeling in our own societies, as Ralph uh, indicated earlier. That's one of the kind of central debates between the sort of majoritarian model of democracy that has been made very popular in Hungary, that's becoming more popular in this country. Um, and the sort of ideas of, of liberalism. But I think it, 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 you know, the two don't necessarily always go together. And certainly when you go out of Europe, um, uh, liberalism seems to be somewhat less popular than democracy. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, you know, there's usually a lag between the, uh, the, the kind of balance of power changing and the ideas which are prevalent in a different place. But I think that that's the sort of stage that we're in at the moment, to go back to, to your question at the beginning. We are living in a post-American world in terms of the, the structure of international politics. The US is still absolutely the, the biggest and the most important power, but it's not 
any longer the the kind of uh, hegemonic dominating power that it was immediately after the Cold War. And that has created a space for a battle of ideas and of norms to emerge in every single different part of the world. And we're in an interregnum. It's too early to know where we're going to end up. But we're finding the world very difficult to understand because uh, things are out of sync and out of balance. And that is creating the space for this kind of new contest to emerge. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So uh, you said that we are facing a battle of ideas, and and this is, a, I think, an interesting notion or an interesting concept. Because the my question for you, uh, Ralph and Judy, would be: uh, What are the alternative ideas actually? Uh, what are the competing well, ideas competing with the ideas of the West? Because there was a very interesting study made by Larry Diamond, the, the one of the most famous world uh, academics dealing with the issues of democracy who um, last year uh, wrote a piece uh, based on his research that author authoritarianism uh, goes global. And he gave uh, examples of, for example, China, Russia, uh, Iran, uh, deliberately promoting uh, ideas of uh, authoritarian regime, uh, illiberal ideas by um, using uh, media outlets in many parts of the world, in Africa, in Asia. And so, so my question would be, is it really a, a, a battle of ideas between the Western uh, value system and, for example, authoritarianism on the, on the other hand, on the other side? Or, um, and, the, and the second question, how can we um, cope with this battle? Can we stick to the idea of the Western, you know, uh, democracy promotion and, uh, or how, how can, because it has, you, you, all of you actually said that it has failed in a way, also with the Arab Spring and uh, this democratization idea of the West. This is a very complex uh, question with different, different layers uh, of answers. Um, one part of the story is what went wrong within the West, uh, which I already started to, to touch upon. And uh, you must not only look to, to, to Europe, look for instance at Brazil. You know, these really, I think a horrifying crisis of the complete political class of the whole elites of the country. Um, I would say be behind a kind of shield of uh, more or less democratic institutions, but the totally absence of responsibility, the total absence of responsibility. And you have it in different uh, shades of grey also in in, in 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 other countries. So there's I would say there's kind of discredit of the democratic idea because of the mismanagement, the uh, um, crisis of governance, uh, the the disresponsibility of elites towards their, their uh, societies. And this, to a certain extent, is corrupting the ideas, which I never would take responsible for that kind of failure. You know, I, from, from, from my perspective, of course we have to stick to, to this great ideal tradition of freedom and, and, and democracy, but we have to deliver politically um, and we, we, we have to confront us, our, ourselves with the shortcomings of the economic, social uh, and societal policies uh, and also the economic politi policies over, over the last uh, 20 years. So we didn't manage globalization very well. But the more maybe optimistic part of the story is that I think that these authoritarian counterpowers, they don't manage to develop a really convincing kind of alternative. 
it is more kind of defensive uh, ideology. Um, and maybe what, what, is, uh, what they have in general, uh, also, of course, it's a lot of differences and, and specific um, um, and, and different uh, uh, cases between China and Russia and Egypt and so on. It's very much about identity politics. Identity politics in terms of nation, nationalism plays a huge role in it sometimes religion, traditional cultural values. Um, and I think identity politics is another uh, uh, term for, or a metaphor, giving people a kind of mental security. Mental security. And I think we, uh, the liberal folks, which are very much engaged in individualization and uh, diversity and openness, we have to find answers to the security needs, not only in social terms, that people need a kind of basic social security, but also in, in a mental way, yeah? the, the, the need for belonging, uh, so and and we have not been very good in in in, in, in that. Um, so I think we it's 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 not just defending our old uh, values and and ideas. I think we 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 need to look for new synergies between this kind of uh, liberal post-national post-identity kind of thinking and and politics and the need to create. Um, also a kind of uh, uh, mental stability and, and uh, uh, a, a framework of security for individuals. Otherwise, only the strong ones, only the well-educated ones, only the elites are able to deal with the growing insecurities of a globalized world. Thanks. Um, well, you've given a lot of food for thought here. If I can pick up on a couple of things, um, the competition of ideas. Well, um, we, we're not only were we not prepared for globalization, we were sleepwalking. And the West, um, Mark brings up the idea of, of the Arab Spring, the element of emancipation. I, I would take it further. Um, the West, the West, um, during the Cold War and after the Cold War, it still believed the outside the West was our, was our area of influence, our persuasion, and so on. And overnight, uh, overnight, um, many of the African states said, this is enough. China comes in here, builds the railroads. OK, China wants the minerals and the commodities. But in return, builds the railroads, um, infrastructure, enterprises, jobs, no conditionality. The EU goes in there, well, we'll give you this if you do this. And the African countries regard this as a kind of modern imperialism of some sort. And I'm sorry, uh, Europe, China now can give us this without any conditionality. Thank you very much. And so we have one element of a non-democratic huge power um, uh, undermining our influence and the West simply unable to match this actually. And I think now this is a real dilemma of the West that we, um, we are not thinking through how we are going to continue to make our values attractive because our values are attractive. Um, you get a, a tinge of this from Viktor Orban when on his, in his speech, which is worth reading, he made in Transylvania a couple of years ago, the illiberal democracy. Um, it's very... He, he, Orban is making this even more sophisticated, hinting that actually um, human rights are not universal rights. Well, if you go down this line, then you make rights selective. And uh, uh, those in the Arab Spring, civil society movements, young people, old people, people who've been tortured, people who belong now to banned uh, movements, they all actually want the same thing, emancipation to run their lives. And this is part of the, uh, of, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And if the West seeds this, the gap is already going to be filled by China. One last point on this. 
Um, you mentioned the, the, uh, the irresponsibility of the elites in Brazil. It's, it's truly shocking. Look at what's happening in Venezuela. Yeah. A huge, energy-rich country, and people queue from two in the morning to get a bag of flour. This is, uh, it, it's, it's, it reminds me of, of how Stalin starved the Ukrainian people. Mm -hmm. It is extraordinary, this huge obsession with holding on to power and building in corruption. And the more they do this, the more actually politics becomes degraded and lack of respect. Yeah. Oh, pardon. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Judy and Ralph. I have a, another a question to Mark related to the to the issue, to the issues you have just discussed. Because Mark has done a lot of work on on the issues of order, world order, European order, liberal order, and uh, again in the context of. Uh, these battle of ideas. Do you think there is, because we are, we are talking about the crisis of the liberal order, or the world's liberal order uh, designed by, by the West. Do you think that the countries like, for example, China, which you also uh, made a very interesting book on, uh, do you think that China has a, an alternative concept how to reinvent the world in terms of you know institutional framework, uh, in terms of um, regulations, uh, low, international law, or, or lack of international law, whatever. Do you think there is any, here, any, uh, any, any competition from that side? I, I mean, I do think China has uh, a slightly different notion of, uh, of order. Um, and it's not just a notion, it is actually building a different kind of order which is based on uh, a rethinking of the whole question of, w of what kinds of relations uh, you want to have between countries. Because one of the interesting things about the discussion so far, which is uh, I think the kind of paradox of the world at the moment, that we all live with the realities of interdependence and we get all the benefits of interdependence, but everyone dreams of independence. And what sort of happened over the last few years is that it's like when the light changes in the room and you see things slightly differently. Interdependence has always had great things about it, huge amount of growth and wealth created. We can go on holiday wherever we like, we can get TV, food, culture, all sorts of different things from different areas. But it's obviously a downside as well. Our societies change, jobs can get undercut, can put pressure on public services, terrorists will come as well as tourists, um, cyber attacks, different kinds of vulnerabilities, financial contagion, energy cutoffs. And whereas during the 1990s, the light shone on all of the good things about interdependence and globalization, after 2008, we noticed a lot of the downsides as well. And the biggest downside that people noticed is that there are losers as well as winners and that a lot of people feel left behind, which leads to this kind of anger. And when you see uh, power changing in the world so that, you know, whereas earlier generations thought that their kids and their grandchildren would have more opportunity and a bigger uh, set of options than they had and now they worry that it's going to be the reverse and that power and resources are going to shift to people in other parts of the world then you get this kind of change in in our politics where it's about trying to hang on to a a larger slice of a shrinking pie which is why the identity politics becomes particularly important but what's interesting about china is that they have been much less sort of uh, sanguine about globalization from the very beginning and they've seen the, the bright side and the dark side and from the very beginning the way that China is engaged with globalization has been selective. They wanted to maintain control and maintain sovereignty. They have bought into global structures but they've done it in a way that was on their own terms and that protected them from the, from the kind of price that, that was paid and they kind of understand that in an interconnected world where uh, that that whole notion of connectivity and who controls it is a source of power and 
you know, if you go back to earlier imperial projects, uh, when all the roads led to Rome, you want to be Rome <laughs> because you're less dependent on others. Everyone else is more dependent on you than you are on them. And that is the, the, the traditional Chinese idea of order and power. It's a Sinocentric world where instead of creating kind of relationships where everyone's involved, what you want to do is be the new Rome and make sure that you have bilateral relationships that radiate out from your capital to everyone else and that you are doing it, that you are more powerful in each of these bilateral relations. And that, I think, is the philosophy which lies behind these incredibly ambitious projects which China is developing, uh, the, the new Silk Roads, which Xi Jinping uh, called the, the, the Belt and the Road, One Belt, One Road, the, his um, maritime uh, Silk Road, and the, 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 uh, the Belt, which is the, uh, the land connections, the iron Silk Roads, which are kind of connecting China to uh, the whole of Eurasia putting itself in a network of 65 countries that all enjoy bilateral relationships with China, but where China can dictate the terms of trade because the Chinese market is so much bigger than the other markets because Chinese capital will be going into their sort of places. And where the institutions are not like European integration, where it's about pooling sovereignty and creating um, binding commitments. It's much more about these sorts of political and economic links which happen. And I think that that sort of uh, new model of integration is, you know, has already transformed Africa, as, as Judy was talking earlier, but is, is equally, it, you know, is starting to change the, the whole of the rest of the world. And it just changes the facts on the ground. It means that people look at the US, at other powers in a, in a slightly different way. And even in the most powerful and the most um, uh, connected countries, you see a change. I, I uh, for the last couple of years, been chairing this um, uh, a, a task force for the World Economic Forum on geoeconomics, and um, I was sitting in um, uh, in one of the countries of the Gulf chairing this committee when uh, Xi Jinping went to London. Uh, it was just after the AIIB scenario when Britain signed up to the AIB, et cetera, and, and he was meeting, sorry, the, uh, the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank. But anyway, one of, my, one of the people on the task force I was, I was uh, doing is, is the former foreign minister and economics minister of Pakistan. And she started mocking me as a British person, because when, when Chinese leaders go to Pakistan, they talk about how amazing China, because there's such a, an unbalanced relationship. Pakistan is totally dependent on China on Chinese money. They've even created a, a kind of part of the, of the Pakistani army that exists just to protect Chinese investments um, on the One Belt, One Road with 14,000 troops. Um, so anyway, she said that your prime minister sounds just like the prime minister of Pakistan, the British, the David Cameron and George Osborne do, the way that he's being so obsequious to the Chinese, not much mention of human rights, uh, et cetera. Anyway, it's an interesting thing that, that Britain, the former imperial country that, was, uh, uh, that used to control part of China, is now again begging for, for Chinese investment. And the relationship has, has been changed completely. It's interesting you say this because for this Polish audience, uh, the Chinese have a particular uh, strategy towards Central and Eastern Europe and the Balkans. I think there's a group of 15 countries now and they meet once a year. I, there was a summit last year in Belgrade. I, I've forgotten where the next one is or maybe it's done already. But this is a Chinese strategy of investing and you should visit Hungary now and you see uh, um, Chinese language schools, Chinese kindergartens, Chinese enterprises. They bought half the chemical industry there. But, and you know, over in Brussels, we're totally oblivious to this. But what, what, it, what it gives China is influence in Brussels when it comes to the arms embargo, when it comes to trade policy, when it comes to regulation. And that's where, I mean, the EU has been very, very slow at to look at this uh, dividing and ruling what's happening. They're good at it, the Chinese. So is Russia. Ladies and gentlemen, we could go on with this conversation here on the podium, uh, but uh, the idea of World in Focus is uh, to give you also an opportunity to ask questions or make comments in Polish, English, uh, as you wish. So I would like to kind of invite you to uh, 
to um, uh, make your contribution to this uh, to this conversation uh, i um, can hardly i can problems to to see if oh here's yeah here and here is anybody who could help with the micro so we will um, pick up a few questions now too and and let you respond. Hello. And please uh, introduce yourself if yeah. you may ask. Um, my name is Sudarshan. I'm, uh, um, I'm from India. I'm an Erasmus uh, exchange student in the University of Warsaw. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was very interesting uh, to see uh, a critical perspective of uh, uh, what West is. Normally, uh, that kind of observation uh, is missing in most of the platforms. So thank you for that. Uh, to start with, uh, where uh, uh, Judy, Mr. Judy has uh, has raised a question uh, that uh, how, how to what extent the normative elements are missing in uh, in the in the in the Western uh, notion of uh, globalization. So and when when uh, when when Mr. Peter also. Uh, uh, initially asked the same uh, thing that where is normative element which is lacking in, in, in the western notion of uh, globalization or western notion of uh, uh, the political uh, approach so uh, somewhere what i see, see is that why west has failed uh, to to see or to, to see further the uh, the growth of uh, the political establishment is uh, that it tries to uh, generalize and universalize the norms what it sees as the the ideal one so, so for example uh, as you as you raised at the first point about the human rights or a rule of law whatever it might be when we talk about the human rights human rights cannot be universalized somewhere west has failed to understand that that for example, if you take uh, first generation uh, right of human rights and the second generation human rights, West try to see the same generation of human rights approach to the Eastern world. So that is always creating more problem to the West to address the outside uh, West. So somewhere. I think that West need to understand that democracy is not about universalization. Differences is a part of... It's not about... Uh, it, it's not about universalization. Universalization means... Universalization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Democracy has as a space for differences. Thank you. Okay, here's another question, and and here, and then another one. Thank you for the, oh sorry, Krzysztof Kogoszczyński, your active Polish office and Kozminski University. Mm, thank you for the interesting discussion, and I would like to ask you about your views, comments on how actually the Western values we uh, you were talking about uh, for the past uh, hour are actually internalized in the Western society itself uh, between the elites and non-elites, as in the recent crisis showed, I think, that in countries both uh, in the core of the West as well as the newcomers that rejoined the West after a few decades of being in the Eastern Bloc, the many people care more about their basic needs and they are willing to let go and forget about many of the values promoted as the universal Western values in return for safety, food, uh, living conditions, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers and panelists for a very interesting discussion. And I'm Marma from Collegium Civitas, Warsaw. Uh, I would like to pick up on what Judy Demse said about this S word, the stabilization. How would you assess uh, the European Union's capacity, or at least potential, in terms of ideas, values, and hard power, 
to provide its neighborhood with this uh, stabilization, uh, given that it's on its agenda now with the, in the framework of the new uh, European neighborhood policy. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Maybe one question more from the gentleman over there. And You have used uh, this uh, notion uh, of our zone of influence when you were talking about Africa. So what is a zone of influence? What do we mean by that? And uh, to continue, what uh, uh, the first gentleman has mentioned about the crisis of uh, democracy. The crisis, if we can look at it synthetically, this crisis is a crisis of discrepancy between the elites that make decisions about everything in democracy and the broad uh, citizens, uh, society of citizens. There's been a huge discrepancy and this mechanism is still being promoted further to the east. It's promoted further to the east uh, in the sense of creating a new zone of influence. And in our situation, this promotion of this kind of of, uh, democratic mechanism in uh, the East, especially in Russia in the 1990s, has finished in tragedy for Russia. And there is no one to blame for that. Russia has gotten up, but it has reorganized in the meantime. Because uh, the mechanism that was promoted at that time has brought the country to a disaster. And now we've got another trial in Ukraine today. The same mechanism of promotion is going to create a country of oligarchs, oligarchs, a country of uh, corruption, and what is even worse, it's creating a country that's creating a new Ukrainian citizen who reaches to the tradition. Of course, everybody in this room knows very well what it is. I've just came back from Ukraine, so we've got a mental transformation that you have also mentioned in the discussion concerning the Ukrainian uh, society Society, which is going uh, clearly towards uh, uh, anti-Russian phobia and nationalism. This is the new reality that we are facing. And this reality, I would say, in the East is not uh, promoting development. It has to invent uh, something new. And I would say this is the uh, Putin's oligarch uh, idea. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, but we have other questions. So if you have a question, please uh, make a conclusion. So everybody wants to stand up against uh, this fall. So uh, something strange is going on. Putin's system is uh, looking for more efficient human resources than democracy. This is a strange phenomenon. So it is not uh, promoting development. So just a question to, to my comment. I, uh, my question to the first speaker. What is the main mechanism of the power of globalization? What are the main powers involved in the process of globalization today? Thank you very much. This is a very serious set of questions, but please uh, make your next questions ready. Let's now go to the answers. Who would like to take up uh, the answers? Oh, thanks. Okay. And, oh, I don't need this. And thank you. Oh, yeah. I need this, too. Uh, I, I thank you for this. Um, this is the... the you, it's, it's a difficult way to pronounce it, the democracy, the universalization of democracy. I, I will, I will, uh, transformations of societies are unbelievably complex. And we have situations in India, which is a huge democracy, but there's huge dysfunctional aspects of, of it as well. The, neither the West nor those competing with the West are any longer imposing democracy. I think we have seen the pitfalls of, of imposing different systems, even though Putin or China may have their own version of a system, but they are not democratic systems, first point. Secondly, 
I actually believe that democracy is universal, yeah. actually. I think democracy for me is the dignity of the individual. It's the emancipation of authoritarian systems. You're quite right when you say if, if there's starvation, who wants democracy for this? But the basic element of democracy is dignity, and dignity must be built into the system. This is the role of civil society, for instance. That's, I, that's, I, you can go back to this if you want to. The second point, I'll be very quick on the stabilization. Yeah, I, you brought it up. Uh, yes, this, it's really important, this, um, this commission report, actually. And I've, I've had long discussions with them. But actually, what you're getting from Tunisia, well, that's a, 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 an exception. But from Morocco, from Algeria, from Egypt particularly, Jordan, security, as I mentioned earlier, stabilization equals security, equals dealing with terrorism. Let's get this under control first. And by the way, there's a package for civil society. But they're trying to integrate the civil society aspect and democracy into it. But at this moment, democracy is, is sort of not on the back burner, but stabilization will come first. Then we can discuss the idea of the democratization of society. I have a different view of this, but on the other hand, um, the citizens and the civil societies are beginning to have an input, but I think the emphasis on security and stabilization is too big. On the other hand, I don't live in these very unstable countries and where the citizens are threatened. Um, that gentleman over there, last time I looked, the people on Maidan were actually wanting democracy and they were waving the EU flag and they wanted to be part of the West. And they weren't manipulated by, by the West or the EU or the oligarchs. In fact, they want to de de oligarchize their society. It's a very, very long, long transformation. It's unbelievably complex, but the civil society and young people and old people and individuals want to make it work. And this is why I think the EU and the West should do everything possible to support them. Thank you very much for your interesting questions. I could continue. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Uh, no, I, I beg your pardon, but I, I really deeply disagree with your description of what is going on in Ukraine. First, it was not the Maidan and the beginning of this kind of democratic transformation of the post-Soviet system in Ukraine, which created oligarchs. No, the oligarch, the, the kind of oligarchic uh, structure of the Ukrainian economy and politics, these kind of links between economic and political power. This was the heritage of the incomplete transformation of the Soviet system. And now, this kind of new attempt to overcome these relics of authoritarianism and to create a kind of modern democratic European Ukraine, they are now confronting this oligarchic system and fighting corruption. There are lots of civil initiatives in Ukraine, citizens' initiatives addressing corruption. Meanwhile, at least in the internet, you have a, a kind of very critical public raising uh, or, or ringing the alarm bell uh, and, and then attacking this kind of oligarchic structure, which is completely new for Ukraine. Uh, you have this, I would say, admirable, uh, huge amount of uh, civic engagement which is also new for these Eastern uh, uh, kind of, of uh, societies. So I'm much more optimistic that instead of all the complications and instead of the, of course, the ongoing power of the old structures, um, Ukraine has a good chance uh, to, to this time to be, to, to, to have a successful um, third attempt, I would say, third attempt of becoming a modern democratic society if we don't let them alone. If we support them politically, uh, financially, of course, I would say also with a certain set of conditions and um, um, agreements about uh, next steps of, of uh, reforms, but 
Um, so and, uh, another part of your question was, um, is, there, is there kind of um, mutual link between democratization and economic modernization? I think this is a crucial question. China tries to demonstrate that there is an alternative, that you, can't ha that you can have economic modernization um, and uh, this kind of social progress for hundreds and millions of people without democratization. But I doubt that that will work on the medium and long term. And we can see in Russia that it will definitely not work. Economic development and economic uh, modernization in Russia will simply not happen without rule of law and kind of basic liberalization, pluralism, uh, checks and balances, all this kind of stuff. Otherwise, there is no chance to fight these kind of kleptocratic, oligarchic, and corrupt dung structures, this kind of rent-seeking rent seeking than, than economies. So I still am quite convinced that there is that kind of link uh, between uh, democracy with a, a creative uh, independence of a society and um, economic innovation and uh, than, than development. And the last remark, also uh, again continuing what, what Judy already started, uh, to, to answer to the gentleman from, from India, I think we should differentiate between a universal set of values and diversity. Universal, uh, the, 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 the idea of uh, the, uh, universal democratic values which are anchored in the Declaration of Human Rights, the Charter of Human Rights. Um, this does not mean at all a kind of equalization or homogenization of all the societies around the world. Diversity and variety is a value in itself, but this should not be in contradiction to share these kind of basic human values. Yeah, so I would say we, 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 we need both. We need a combination uh, of this um, really universal or, or a global set of values, which would be the basis of a normative or rule-based global governance system. If you give up the idea of universal values, you are at the same time giving up the idea of a rule-based or a normative global governance system. And then you will fall back into this kind of geopolitical power play, which will be extremely dangerous. Uh, so I, I would urge you not, not to uh, not, not to mix these two uh, arguments, you know, universalization of, of uh, or universal uh, democratic values and diversity. These are two different uh, pair of shoes. Thank you very much, Ralph. We, we can pick up some, a few more questions uh, if there are, um, I don't see at the moment, but yet on, over there, please. Um, hi, Zosia Lutkiewicz, College of Europe. Um, you talked a lot about the credibility of the Western model, um, but sometimes, uh, as we can see, for example, from the, uh, the evolution uh, of the European neighborhood policy, we tend to put um, stability and interest before democracy and human rights. Um, so my question is, how can the EU reconcile being um, a normative power, a credible democracy promoter um, with actions such as lifting off the sanctions of Belarus. Thank you. Any, any other question? Uh, oh, please, here, in the same row. Sorry. 
Justyna Duryas Buchak, Rural Development Foundation. Uh, I have a question which may seem uh, very parochial in the, in the context of uh, our discussion, but uh, providing um, what is the, the political attitude of our uh, current government and what have been said about China and Russia here, uh, is Poland to, give, uh, to become a, like a playground between China and Russia in their struggle for influence of Europe? Huh. Are there any, any other comments or questions here in the first, and, uh, not in the first, but the fourth, <laughs> fourth row? Uh, hello, Daniel Tkac, uh, freelance journalist in Brussels. Um, I have a question, a hypothetical one, perhaps. Uh, we're talking, um, Mark Leonard, I think, uh, argumented quite well that we're living in a post-American era. And um, Judy Dempsey uh, described uh, the situation in the US where the talk about Europe doesn't matter anymore. It's a faraway place. Um, however, for Europe, I think, and in this discussion, um, the word West still plays a significant value. I mean, after the book, after the book of Edward Said, nobody would dare, nobody in the right in the right minds would dare to use the term East, as uh, which is uh, after the book Orientalism is not a term that one is one would be using. But we're still using the term West. Isn't it perhaps the time to drop the term and use underline? The difference between US and Europe, wouldn't it perhaps be more beneficial in relation to both China, Russia? That's my question. Yeah, thank you very much for this very interesting question. And. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so we will get back to the panel, I think, because, Mark, would you like to start? Um, well, credibility um, and values um, and Belarus. Um, I mean, my own feeling is there's nothing wrong with having interests. Uh, everyone has them. And there's nothing wrong with having a foreign policy that defends those interests. Because that's what foreign policy is for. <laughs> Um, but we've got to a stage in European countries where we're quite uncomfortable talking about our interests and we tend to shroud all of our discussion uh, within a patina of, uh, of, of, of kind of relatively sort of loose talk about uh, values. And that's one of the things which tends to upset other countries because it makes us look very hypocritical. Because rather than admitting that sometimes we're doing things for reasons which are not related to altruism, but because they serve our interests, we end up saying stupid things about, um, uh, which, which, which undermines the talk of our values. For example, uh, there are lots of very good interest-based reasons why one might want to have a relationship with uh, with Russia, for example, yeah. um, and should be possible to do things with Russia in Syria or on Iran in other countries without thinking that Russia is a perfect democracy. Equally, it should be possible to have a relationship with China and to be critical of China on human rights issues, uh, and might even be possible to have a, a refugee deal with Turkey without thinking that Erdogan is a, a perfect Democrat who's going to join the European Union anytime soon because of his fulfillment of the Copenhagen criteria. Uh, but uh, the, the difficulty is it's more likely we're going to say that Erdogan is fulfilling the Copenhagen criteria rather yeah. than say he's not fulfilling it and we still want to have a deal with you because we have kind of interests at stake. When it comes to sanctions, I, I do think that they are an important tool of, of, uh, of foreign policy um, and that once we introduce them, we should be very clear what the kind of exit strategy is and what it is that what they're designed to do 
uh, and what conditions should be attached to them. And I think if we introduce sanctions with very clear conditions uh, attached to them, and then we remove them when those conditions have not been fulfilled, that's a kind of, yeah. it's a bad idea. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I think that um, that does sometimes happen to us. We introduced sanctions towards Uzbekistan based on particular violations of human rights, and then we removed them without them having fulfilled it. And that's worse than not having introduced them in the first place. Uh, yeah. So I think we need to think quite carefully about that. But I think it's perfectly fine for us to have a relationship with Lukashenko. But equally, I think it's perfectly fine for us to be very critical of Lukashenko, to talk about him as the brutal dictator that he is. Um, and uh, that just because um, we are interested in making sure that uh, we're kind of balancing Russian hegemony doesn't mean to, that we have to, to be any less blunt about the internal developments in, 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 in Belarus. Um, hey, sorry, kind of lengthy answer uh, to, your, to your question. Um, maybe I'll just leave it there, given that we're, we're sort of short of time. I, I, I promise I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, it was a mistake lifting the, the sanctions on Belarus. Uh, the day after, uh, the, the death penalty was imposed on somebody. Um, Lukashenko, as a sop to us, released a couple of uh, political prisoners. There's far more in the jails. And many of the activists are in this country thanks to Poland's hospitality and commitment to this. Um, I, I, the, this EU diplomacy, oh, we failed with the sanctions. I, 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 I disagree. And just because, just because we think, well, now that Lukashenko, he's a bit pro-European now and a bit anti-Russian, I'm sorry, we've been down there before. So I think we seem to have learned nothing about the past. Poland becoming a playground for Russia and, uh, uh, Russia and China, well, I'm sorry, you've got to decide frankly, and um, you've got to decide where you're, you're already in the EU, you are in NATO, the fact that you, um, who, who's the gentleman that raised the question, um, the fact that you raised it clearly indicates that you're pretty worried. Maybe we can go back to this later, but um, as it is, Poland has played a hugely important role uh, in Ukraine last year, and I hope under the new Polish government, um, it will continue to, to make its voice heard. Um, on the West, you're actually saying is the word anachronistic. Uh, well, the West is more than uh, uh, the West is more than Europe and, um, and, the, and the United States. It's, it's Australia, it's New Zealand, it's swathes, it's swathes of democracies, and they should be. I, mean, well, I don't want to. Hear, they are part of the Western, the, the Western um, transformation process, actually, in the Western support of, of, of the democracy, which the gentleman from India raised. Thank you. Oh, maybe, maybe. I, I Will allow me just to sharpen a little bit your, your answer. You know, separating the, the Europe from the United States, this is just the strategic goal of Russia. The long term strategic goal of Russia. And by separating the, uh, Europe from the United States, then creating a kind of hegemonial Eurasian sphere dominated by, 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 by Russia. And this will not be a liberal Europe. Definitely not a liberal Europe, not a democratic Europe, not an open-minded Europe. So I have two, two reservations against that proposal. The one is, uh, if you will, well, a real a realpolitik uh, argument that um, Europe needs the alliance with the United States to act as a global player in a democratic alliance or in an alliance of democracies, uh, which is wider and richer, as uh, Judy mentioned, than just Europe and the United States. And I would be very much in favor of enlarging and enhancing this alliance of democracies beyond the old European or, or Euro-Atlantic uh, line axis, including democratic states from the, the uh, developing world. And the other argument is that still, I think, and maybe that will change, unfortunately, but still I think that this kind of 
Euro-Atlantic Alliance is a kind of provision to keep our democratic and liberal values. So I would not give up it voluntarily. We will see what will happen in the United States and we will see what will happen in, in, in Europe. Maybe we will drift in that kind of separation, but I will not be like, and I will not be happy with that. Mark, you wanted to come in briefly. Just on the, this question around should we still talk about the West, is it anachronistic or not? Um, I mean, I think that we should talk about the West when we're talking about the West, which is Europe and the United States. I mean, I, I wouldn't, you know, that there are other former British colonies like Australia, Canada, etc., which might, you might kind of wind up in that. I don't think India thinks of itself as the West. Japan doesn't really think of itself as the West. Uh, so I don't think they are the West. And, you know, there are other kind of things that tie them together. I don't think democracies, by and large, tend to agree that much on, on, uh, on many uh, issues. There's no particular reason why. I think that democracy is one of the kind of great advances of human civilization, and I'll defend anybody's right to have a vote and to elect their government and to be free, uh, etc. But um, most of the big fights in the world uh, over the next period of time will be between democracies. It's not going to be a fight between democracies and autocratic countries because that's not a kind of significant dividing line uh, and more and more uh, countries that are democratic are becoming illiberal and, uh, and, and autocratic countries are becoming more and more participative so there's a blur there isn't a kind of clear distinction between an autocratic country like um, Russia and a democratic country like uh, Turkey, for example, or Hungary or whatever. <laughs> I think they're on a continuum. <laughs> uh, and and uh, so, um, but, but equally, in policy terms, Turkey doesn't necessarily end up having exactly the same attitude on, uh, to, on Syria as, say, um, uh, well, you know, neighbouring countries that, that are... So I, I don't think there's, there's a kind of necessary thing. I mean, some of the big bust-ups in the, in the last period of time have been between democracies about how we handle uh, some of these sorts of things. So, but, so I, 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 the other kind of interesting question about the West is, is you know, where we started with, with, with Ralph's very powerful kind of talk about the changes in domestic sides. I mean, I think the West... Um, uh, is, is, is maybe partly becoming anachronistic because of immigration and all the other sorts of things that are going on. So if you look at the United States of America and its demographic base, it's obviously much less Eurocentric than it was when all the elites came from Europe. <laughs> um, to hold. But, but there is also that kind of generational change amongst our elites as well, which Judy talked about. So that, you, you know, you are increasingly seeing a post-Western approach. And even in Israel, a country whose entire existence was predicated on, on support from the United States and, and from the West, they're completely radically changing their perspectives, building up kind of weird relationships with Russia, with other kinds of countries. So, uh, you know, um, I, I think for, it's those sorts of things that maybe make it more anachronistic than some kind of fear of Orientalism. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark, and uh, thank you, uh, Judy and Ralph, for your contributions. We could continue this discussion for, for another hour or, or longer, but uh, our time has run out. And um, But the good thing about it is that uh, that was just the beginning, and uh, this uh, panel was meant uh, not only to discuss the issue of the future of the West, but also to be a sort of a teaser for, uh, for the next rounds of discussions which will take place in this... Um, uh, in this room and two others um, in this building. Uh, in 15 minutes, uh, we will have here the panel on the co conflicts of the future with Mark, so he's staying all, on this on this scene. And in two other rooms, there will be a parlor sessions. Um, uh, so please uh, look up in um, in the in the program where we, you would like to go. And uh, I I think that was a very good beginning and a very inspiring discussion. So thank.
thank you very much uh, once again. Uh, thank you for your questions and for your interest. And I hope you will join us in um, our sessions, other sessions as well. Thank you very much and uh, see you see you soon.